Nana's house had been the place for holidays with my dad's family, <clears throat> hanging out with the cousins on Christmas. But when I was eight, my parents divorced and my father moved in with Nana, and that's where my brother and I visited him a couple of times a week. When we had dinner at Nana's house, my father cooked, and I sat in the kitchen with him, catching up on current events while my father explained his cooking process. You have to use a double boiler so it won't scald or stick to the pot, he would say. The flame heats the water in the lower pan, and that heats the pan with the food in it, so it can't get so hot as to burn. This made sense to me as I gazed up at him, watching him cook. And you have to be careful stirring it so you don't break the ravioli, he would say, as if a broken ravioli was something to avoid at all costs. It was Chef Boyardee ravioli, right out of the can. <laughs> that was the food he was preparing so carefully, with elaborate theories to justify his process. <laughs> it was absurd, but back then I was convinced that my father was right about the double boiler and that he was a genius for figuring it out and explaining it so clearly. But my father didn't confine his genius to cooking canned ravioli. He had a second, more complicated creation, corned beef hash. <laughs> Unlike the ravioli, the hash was not spooned straight out of the can. Instead, my father himself composed the two separate ingredients, corned beef and potatoes. Of course, the corned beef was out of a can, an oval can that you opened with a key. Oddly, the potatoes were also canned. <laughs> my father would open a can of potatoes and pour them into a bowl. Small white balls about an inch in diameter, pre-peeled. Then he went through each potato and carefully removed any peels or discolored spots before chopping up the potatoes and mixing them with the corned beef and mashing the whole results into a frying pan. I don't want there to be any bits of peel or spots on the potatoes, he'd say, almost to himself. After a half hour or so of discussing his work in my school while the corned beef cooked, we would sit down at the kitchen table with my younger brother. We'd eat the hash, each of us habitually pouring a half bottle or so of A1 sauce on our respective portions. <laughs> And my father would hold forth, telling silly stories about growing up in the neighborhood. There were tales of going to school at St. Gregory's up the street and playing football in Dorchester Park behind Nana's house. And other stories of working selling newspapers and as a grocery clerk at the First National Store at the top of the street while he was going to Boston College. My dad's stories were a riot and he told them over and over again with no loss of entertainment value, at least for me. My favorite ones were about his friend Booger Madden. Booger was crazy and was always getting into bizarre misadventures, stealing apples from the churchyard and getting chased by the parish priest, and once getting an entire crate of Coke bottles dumped on his head at the grocery store due to negligent use of a dumbwaiter. The facts of my dad's stories weren't so unusual or improbable, but the way my father built up the scenes was so effective, there always seemed to be high drama in the situation, even a situation so mundane as a kid showing up to school after getting sprayed by a skunk in the park. My father described his schoolmate as truly hapless, and my father's description of his arrival in the classroom and the nun's reaction was so dramatic and absurd, it was like we were hearing her repeatedly scream, get out, just as my father had experienced it. We always laughed and laughed until we almost cried, rapidly choking down our corned beef hash smothered in A1 sauce, and getting up for seconds if we were still hungry. My father was so happy to be telling us his stories, and we were so happy to hear them. Because we were sitting in the kitchen my dad grew up in, the stories all took place within a few hundred yards of where we sat together eating dinner. It was a nondescript urban residential neighborhood, but the world my father conjured from it and the characters he described were magical to my brother and me. When I was about 19, I was at college visiting a friend in her dorm room. We were just hanging out chatting, and she asked me what last meal I would choose if I was on death row. I would have corned beef hash, I said. Seriously, she said? Yeah, it's always been my favorite food. She couldn't believe I had chosen such a basic favorite meal, and she asked me why. I told her I didn't know why. A couple of years ago, I got a text from my father. By this time, my father was in his 70s and his voice had weakened due to repeated surgeries on his vocal cords. 
We had to text because I could no longer make out what he was saying over the phone. My father explained that the cancer in his throat had spread, so we needed chemo and radiation. He explicitly stated that he was confident he would get through the process without difficulty, that he was hopeful about the success of the treatment, but that he was prepared to accept any outcome with equanimity. His text read, I don't want you to worry over this, as there's nothing for you to do about it. Despite my father's reassurances, I moved back across the country to Massachusetts to be closer to him during that time. His treatments did not go well. He was so debilitated by the radiation and chemo that he had to live in a rehab hospital for several months. And only a few weeks after the treatments ended, his throat closed up and he needed a tracheotomy. But when they checked out the area in his neck where the tube was to be inserted, they found a large tumor. So he had a laryngectomy instead, a gruesome procedure in which most of his throat was removed and replaced by other tissue. When the surgery was done, I heard about it from my stepmother, Suzanne, over the phone. How did it go, I asked her. My God, she said, I wasn't prepared for it. Uh-huh, I prodded. Your father looks like Frankenstein's monster. He has staples crisscrossing him all over his neck and chest. It's awful. Suzanne began to cry. Well, I said, I don't think it's a good idea to go by how he looks only a few minutes after the work was done. I mean, the swelling and so on is bound to go down quickly, and he will look a thousand times better in a day or two. You think so, Suzanne asked me? Oh, yeah, I said. I'm sure of it. I said this with false confidence. When I got to see my dad for myself, he didn't look too good. The staples were abundant and the seams imperfect. But he perked up when he saw me and reached for the pad he wrote on since he could no longer speak. How is work going, he asked me. I told him it was going great and he smiled at me with his eyes like Irish people do. I thought he was doing well and it would be okay. The cancer came back a few months later and my father was told he had only a couple of months left to live. Suzanne told me this, but the next time I saw him, I pretended I hadn't heard. Has there been any talk of a prognosis? I asked vaguely, taking a seat by his hospital bed. He picked up his pad and wrote, three months with declining health. I nodded and sighed. How are you feeling about it? I asked. He cleared the screen and wrote, I'm a little taken aback by the shortness of the time. I listened to Suzanne crying in the background and said nothing. I had never heard my father express discontent or consternation before. His words were carefully and well chosen, but writing on that notepad, he didn't have the energy to articulate his meaning as fully as he wanted, or as fully as I wanted. Two months later, my father had only a few days left. I stayed at their condo to help care for him. Suzanne showed me how to prepare my father's food. First, I had to put water on to boil. Then I placed several large pills, mostly painkillers in a mortar, to be ground up. Once they were ground up, I added the pills that dissolved and melted and poured in the boiling water. Once all the pills either melted or dissolved in the hot water, I added it into a short glass with a bottle of Ensure. Then I took this glass of medication-infused Ensure to my father and pumped it directly into a tube in his stomach using a large plastic syringe. When I stood at the kitchen counter putting together my father's food, it struck me that Ensure through a tube was a poor last meal. I thought about the corned beef hash that I used to like so much. In all my adult life, I've never attempted to make that meal. I'm sure I could probably have executed my father's primitive recipe easily enough but I've never wanted to cook it for myself, and I never felt like I was missing it. My father mostly slept that weekend, except when I had to feed him. He had to be awake to open the valve in his stomach before I pushed the insurer in. On the second day, Sunday, the last meal I would serve him, he stopped me from beginning the process by writing a question for me on the pad. Are you happy, it said? Yeah, I said, I love the job, you know. It was a job he'd gotten me, doing inmate reentry at a, country, a county jail. My father nodded his approval. He was anxious for me to have a job with real meaning. He thought it would help me be happy. That's why I mentioned it in response to his question. <laughs>
He cleared the screen and asked me one more question. Is there anything missing? It was the kind of direct question we usually avoided asking each other. I had to think for a moment what I should say. Well, I mean, not every single thing is lined up, I said. Like the dating piece. It's a little slow where I'm living now. And maybe I'm a bit lonely at times. I tried to be upbeat. But I never worry about that, I said. It will get solved soon enough. He nodded his head and wrote, I'm sure it will. I picked up the syringe and drew some of the drug-infused Ensure, and my dad adjusted the valve. Suddenly it occurred to me that I was following Suzanne's instructions as carefully as I could, but maybe I wasn't doing the feeding exactly right. You know, Dad, I said, I have no particular dogmatic commitment to the way I'm doing this with the syringe. I mean, if there's something you'd like me to change about it. He stopped fidgeting with the valve and picked up the pad and wrote a few words. You're doing great, it said. I smiled at this and he smiled at me too, looking at me, but also past me and beyond me. I got up and went to rinse out the syringe and when I came back he was asleep. An hour later the night nurse arrived and I left to drive back home as I had work the next day. A couple of days later, after that I awoke to see I had a voicemail from Suzanne. Even before I listened to the message, I knew he was gone. <laughs>